Good morning. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I'm actually delighted and excited to, to have these uh, fine gentlemen up here in the uh, to talk about uh, the current state and future of investing in this uh, in this fine industry of ours. Um, and uh, I think it might make sense to begin just with quick introductions. My name is uh, Pepper Mofrian. I am um, a Stanford graduate. I actually studied under Jim Sweeney and uh, worked at the Freeport Institute for Energy Efficiency back when I was uh, named that. Um, my focus was on uh, understanding power systems, uh, energy efficiency, and distributed generation. Um, left Stanford to join Mayfield to help build out energy investment practice there. And we made a handful of investments there. Our biggest was Solar City, uh, which we're particularly proud of. Um, and we're, we're continuing to kind of look into see how this ecosystem can evolve. But um, I'm not going to do a lot of the talking today. I actually want to have uh, these folks. Uh, so I'll begin with Dave Mount here. He's, he's Great. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm Dave Mount. I am a partner at Kleiner Perkins Coffee and Buyers. We're a venture capital investor. I work in our sustainability fund. Uh, it's called the Green Growth Fund. We're investors in companies like uh, Clean Power Finance, O Power, Silver Spring Networks, uh, and, and of course, some others. Time Perkins is also invested in Nest. Uh, I've spent a lot of time over the past six years in utility facing businesses, in, in energy efficiency, and uh, I've learned some, some great lessons, some hard lessons, and uh, looking forward to the panel. Hi, my name is Elon Gur. Uh, I'm a scientist, PhD in material science from uh, Public University across the day. Um, I uh, was involved in launching a, a couple of materials based startups uh, in the energy space and then had a phenomenal opportunity to go be uh, one of a handful of program directors at RPE. For those who don't know, RPE is sort of the Scum Works funding agency for the Department of Energy. Um, I think what's relevant to know about RPE is uh, over the last five years now, um, we've put out close to a billion dollars across hundreds of really early stage disruptive hard technology projects uh, in the energy space. So I'd say that's kind of, you know, more than any of the, of the VC funds here in the Valley have done. Um, had a lot of insight around sort of the innovation ecosystem and portfolio of energy innovation across the country. Um, and look forward to sharing some of that insight here. Can we get that for now? Yeah, uh, Ross Channon, I'm the CEO of American Efficient. Uh, we are an early stage and now actually a growth stage uh, startup um, in the sector. Um, so we are, we are a marketing and uh, software network. Uh, to brand and acquire consumers for basically good products and services. And the first vertical in which we've started has been the, uh, the, the renewable energy sector, um, as well as now very soon uh, is the DG rooftop solar. Um, and this comes out of, as Dave mentions, uh, a number, a number of work, a good amount of work in respect to energy efficiency, more on the regulated side, which we'll speak about more today, and where we see a lot of opportunity, excited, and more on the deregulated sales side of, of renewables and power. Um, and so, some interesting conversations to have both with the wholesale um, and the retail level of that. So. And I'm Corey Screening with Voyager Capital. We're an early stage IT investor, and uh, we look at energy opportunities. Uh, from the IT solution side, so we'll talk more about that in a bit. I don't know about you, but there's a Nobel Prize winning uh, <laughs> panelist in the next room, and I would text in and engineers don't know about you, but I'm definitely wrong. Uh, but, but I worked at Stanford Endowment in the 90s, and that was interesting because the, the whole idea of sustainable investing was beginning to take hold, and we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we as a, as a university make long-term profitable investments in a sustainable area and it was it was confounding and we'll talk specifically about why it's confounding and why it's it's not necessarily matched the art of, of IT investing and uh, biotech and medical device investing we have some formed quite a thesis around that as well so terrific so the, the idea, uh, by the way, for, for this particular panel is I'd like to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I've kind of picked uh, these, these uh, folks here is that they each individually represent a different scope and a different perspective on the entire clean tech landscape right now. Um, from 
early stage to growth stage investing to very, very early stage in government-oriented uh, grant programs uh, and, and sort of scientific uh, innovations and to an actual operator who's actually going out there and raising money right now and can tell you about it. So uh, if, there's, if there's any questions, please, like we're going to have some room at the end for Q&A, but uh, please feel free to kind of raise your hand. I think there's a mic going around. Um, so actually, first, on that note that you just left on, um, I guess the first question that I like to ask is, you know, what exactly is the, the difference between energy and some of the other sectors you looked at, and, and how are you looking at things? You know, what's your filter today? So at, at the macro level, investing in clean tech or energy is a daunting task, and there, there's a lot of macro reasons why it is very different and investing in the sort of high change IT sector or biotech sector. One of the biggest reasons is there is a large universe of incumbent uh, companies in, in information technology and in healthcare and biotech who know that competitively they need to keep an eye on new technologies coming along and be ready to acquire them or compete with them. And they, and they are also armed with the cash and the balance sheet and the price and this multiple to do that very well. And the industry changes so fast that if you miss one of those key technologies, you get punished. And so there's there's sort of a race to these opportunities. Energy is much slower moving, it's much more capital intensive. And the problem is the incumbents are not necessarily interested in a new technology disrupting their supply chain, their existing. So you don't have this large opportunity of M and A, people hungry to take the advantage away from their competitors. In fact, they act the opposite. They're hungry to. They're like weed be gone. They're looking for these little starts. They're spraying them in their garden to keep them out. And one of my favorite stories of how this works is a company called uh, Wind. I think it was called Tower Tech. They had great technology on, on rooftop cooling towers that was a vertical cooling te technology. And in, in investing, you look for 10 times better, 10 times cheaper. Well, it wasn't quite that, but it was a significant ROI to any consumer who had rooftop towers for cooling because you had a much smaller unit, much higher efficiency, much lower cost, much lower structural uh, requirements to set it up there. And they, they did a smart thing. They started point solutions for specific large companies. And they got going, and they got funding, and it was great. Next thing you know, they go a big plant, they got bond funding, and now they're building a, a very large, go out to compete with train carrier and all the big guys. As soon as they finished the plant, they didn't win another word. Why? The big guys just stepped on their air hooks. They bought every deal that came along, and that guy, and they went out of business as soon as they got levered up. Because of the capital uh, intensity of these kind of investments, you're very at risk at the point you lever up to go and, and expand your new line. So I think that's one of the biggest problems you have in, in certain kinds of things. Okay, I'll jump in there. Uh, one of the things that, that I, we get asked a lot is what what have we learned from what went wrong? And what have we learned about investing in FinTech now? And years later, after there was a there was a huge rush into into FinTech investing in 2009. And um, so I would, I would take that kind of a couple of ways. One is I would say 2014 is very different from 2008, 2009. Um, and we're seeing the fruits of some of the investments that were made in 08 and 09 now not come to bear. It's possible. So uh, solar is more solar was installed in the last 18 months than in cumulative history uh, in the United States over 30 years before that. Um, LED lighting is, is quadrupling this year. Um, there's some great stats from a guy called Rob Day uh, in Green Tech Media just last week about the current state of, of clean tech and the fact that. Uh, t uh, what was it? Um, they think that, that energy storage is going to grow back to 10x in the next six years. So all the, the growth is really happening. So I don't, I don't want to, uh, to get too glum as I'm about to go say what went wrong and the hundreds of millions of dollars that were lost. But I think there were, there were three, three key learnings, and, and uh, I've tried to distill it to the three C's. It was uh, capital, customers, and competition. And, and some of these are going to be right with what Curtis was talking about, so I figured we may as well sit now. Um, the first mistake that was made was, was capital. In 2008, capital availability was very, very different than it is today. If you had a startup, you could actually fund a capital-intensive business plan to go put dollars on top of buildings. And you could raise 20, 50, 75 million dollars if you thought you were going to be 10 times cheaper or, or uh, 10 times better. 
because the capital is available and uh, people are looking for things to do with it. And, and that has certainly changed. So, so business plans were just fundamentally built assuming the capital was always going to be there. And that, that was wrong. The second was, uh, was customers. So again, there, there was a certain risk tolerance that was assumed in the customer base with investors and entrepreneurs who were, who were used to technology. And they thought, okay, if I've got something that's going to make an IT manager's job easier, I'm going to be able to sell it to them. They'll buy five million of it just to see if it works. And then we'll be able to, to build into these programs. And I, I had a good heart to heart with a, um, with a utility executive that I've gotten to know who said, look, Dave, if, if I buy technology and it goes down, I'm in real trouble. If an IT manager buys Salesforce and it's up 99% of the time, but like two times a month, you've got six hours where it goes down, or your Gmail goes down every six months. If the electric power grid was down as often as Gmail was down, I'd be fired. And governors get fired for that type of thing. So you can, we don't accept the same level of risk that IT guys accept. And so we needed to appreciate that. And we, I don't think the, the, uh, the technology investing uh, VC minds fully appreciated that early on. So customers didn't just come along when technology was developed. It took a long time to get those relationships up. And sometimes it took too much capital to sort of keep the company moving while that happened. The third was competition. So while it took longer for, for companies to build the solar panels at the level of efficiency they thought they were going to get, it took a little longer for a company to build the metering communications they thought they were going to be able to build. While they were doing that work, the competition wasn't just sitting on their hands. So I think there were, there were a number of business plans that were funded where six month, 12 month slips happened and then it turned out that the competitor in China, the competitor in Texas, the competitor in Japan or Korea was moving way faster than, than uh, domestic companies or some startups gave them credit for. So that also um, brings some clocks. Those are, I think, are the things that we, that we realized and the things that we're now investing, understanding better, and it's leading to better investments and, and I think a, a more healthy ecosystem going forward. So from, from a non-IT perspective, more on the scientific innovation, I want to turn that same question to you. Like, how, how have you seen things evolving since you started your company back six, six years, seven years ago? Yeah. To then the yeah. stuff that you've seen since. Well, I mean, I think there's no question there's been a dramatic evolution. Uh, I think RPE sort of is a, is a good kind of case study for thinking through that in the sense that RPE started basically getting out funding. Nine, are these set up to basically do the type of really hard disruptive research that the private sector wouldn't otherwise do in 2009, 2010? There were a lot of conversations, and the line between what Part E was funding and what VCs were funding in terms of these big bets early stage, which was happening quite a bit, 07, 08, 09, kind of right into around there, and then I think it started waning. But um, the line was pretty fuzzy. And, and we would work really hard when we would invest, you know, when we would give a, an award to an early stage company to figure out, you know, why isn't your venture capitalist already funding this, the funding for other things, et cetera. That has completely changed. There is no issue in terms of thinking about where's the line between RPE and the VCs, because the stuff that RPE funds today, the VCs aren't touching. Um, even, and it's a, it's a concern, because it's not just that we have issues of are we overlapping that we have to, that RPE would have to think about, um, but now the issue is, even if we fund this and, and RPE gives out, I'm sorry, I'm saying we, I'm no longer at RPE, let me be very clear about that, but it's it's been a recent transition, so I'm, I'm in the mode of saying we, but let's see, we as a taxpayer, as the U.S. government. Um, uh, there's a question of even if, if RPE gives an award of say three, four million dollars into a really hard technology, um, even after that point, would the venture capital community think about that? So the, the latest numbers, I mean, different people have different numbers. I think the one that's easy to cite is Price Water Pass Coopers and, and BCA. The most recent report for Q1 of 2014 basically says, you know, it's done. You know, early stage, new money in to energy technologies, which are what I would consider hard tech, meaning not a software play, not a business model play. Um, you know, I think the, the description of this panel used the word we are a winner. Um, and I, I think that's true. So there are a few different ways to react to that. Um, one is to say, well, if investments from five years ago are now starting to come to some fruition, 
what's happening to the pipeline for five years from now, and what are the right financing mechanisms to basically reinvigorate that pipeline. Uh, from my vantage point that I had at RPE, I had a much scarier sort of perspective, which was if we forget about the financing business model side of this, what I saw was if we're looking at technology innovation and the idea of really aggressively, intensively developing technologies with impact as the driver, as soon as early stage startups went away, we basically stopped having, right, we lost this, this very, very compelling environment, which was a small, passionate group of people whose lives are on the line to take a technology, de-risk it, and get it to some next stage towards impact and towards making a, a, an impact in the marketplace. And without the early stage VCs, we have a research ecosystem that's composed largely of academic projects, people who are doing long-term careers in research and big corporate research labs, and those look a little bit different. And so one piece of this is to say, and sorry, I'm rambling on here a little bit, but one piece of this is to say, if we really think that energy and climate is such a big issue, threat, opportunity, depending which side of the coin you're looking on, um, we need a lot of shots on goals. We talk about shots on goals a lot when it comes to developing technologies. Uh, Rather than growing the shots on goals we have in terms of how we develop technologies, those are actually shrinking because we just lost a very compelling mode of, of doing this sort of r and Maybe more importantly, what I saw at RPE over the last few years across the country is that early stage startups were a home for a certain type of innovator. The type of person who basically said, hey, I could probably go be a professor at Harvard, but that's not really my calling to be a professor. And you know, going to join a big company doesn't really feel like the right fit. Those are the folks who used to start these companies today are sort of peering over the edge from the last startup they did, from their postdoc or PhD, and saying, where's the right home for me in this space? And I, you know, every couple of weeks I hear about another person who has decided, you know what, I'm gonna go to Google X because it's the right environment, even though I'm not gonna be able to work on energy anymore, or Apple, or you know any number of places. So so that for me is like a very very. Um, sorry, I just feel like I gave a speech here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, obviously, I, it, it means a lot to me. But but I think that's the thing on the early stage we really have to be worried about right now. Yeah. Um, and and sort of from from a person that's oh. Yeah, I just had a question along that line. Uh, you hear a lot of media coverage about the energy sector as um, a global warming kind of problem we solved. And uh, while it's been that case, all the, kind of the entire ecosystem is not structured to really get focused on solving that problem, right? Just as you said, even to where the talent is now starting to fly. So do you guys ever hear in your conversations with policymakers of, of, of framing that problem as a national security problem, the, the ability to provide domestic energy? as a national security problem, much like the military complex going after space was back in the 60s. To kind of just say, look, everybody, we're clearing the decks on any structural impediment, like the absolute uh, fear factor of technology risk in the utility industry and the regulated markets. Do you, do, you, do you hear any of the policymakers or any of the executives in the kind of the, the governor level and or the federal level kind of getting that framing of it yet, or is it still like they just don't see it that way? It, you know, it's, it's, one, it's one amongst others, and it's not the first one you might hear, and it's certainly one that needs more effort. You know, make them agree more, because what obviously what you're doing when you're talking about security, you're opening up the access to that narrative to a wider group of people, so kind of what's being said here as well. Yeah. That, yeah, so something to look at, something to do, and then obviously from a from a regulated perspective, when you talk about security implications, it kind of helps you with conversation. Yeah, but I, I, it's kind of broad swap statements. That made those. I think it depends on the, the type of regulator you're talking to. But a lot of this regulation, the really important regulation, is happening at a state level. And the state regulators are not, that's not a priority, that's not what they're thinking about. And I don't know if that's what should be what they're thinking about. But when you talk to national legislators, they are thinking about it. And uh, I wanted to bring this up today, because this morning I woke up, and I think about this as a security issue as well. And, and uh, I actually took a, took a screenshot of my phone, so I woke up to two updates uh, from, from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. The Wall Street Journal said, Iraqi insurgents capture old chemical weapons facility 
but aren't likely to create a functional weapon. So that's, that's ISIS has now captured that. Then uh, the New York Times headline, Iraqi factions jump to house Malkai with U.S. support. So this is not getting simpler. This is not going to get less complicated. And I, I believe that energy is, and security are all wrapped into one. And, uh, and so they're, they're talking about it, they're thinking about it, but haven't been able to find a, a way to rally uh, yeah. I, I think this is a dialogue that's involved also, obviously, over the last few years. Uh, in 73, energy was clearly a national security issue. Uh, I think in 2008, it seemed like that might be one of the big pieces of this story in terms of domestic access to energy sources. And we live in a different world uh, with natural gas, with oil production domestically. And so, I do think what's happened is one, and I'm not an expert on, on the Department of Defense side, but um, having worked with those guys a bunch and seeing, you know, those folks a bunch and seeing the dialogue there, I think the government of DOD has realized that there are major security issues obviously around, around energy resources. Given a pretty strong domestic resource base right now, I think a lot of that dialogue is, is Coming things related to the fact that you know out on the field, forward and operating bases, etc. You know, energy needs lots in terms of transporting it and energy, in terms of reliability of that energy, and the other pieces. You know, a lot of the industries we talk about and the technologies we talk about in energy, in, in energy, are these sort of more industrial materials, you know, hardware types of systems. The underlying technology of which is embedded in just about everything that's happening. Um, so I think that has become a much more rich conversation, and there's been a lot more excitement about how to leverage the dual stuff. So, so as much as I'm, I'm trying to stay mum, but I, I will answer this particular question. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was asked to join a, a working group at the Uber Institute here. Um, I'm <laughs> trying to save energy, right? <laughs> um, and, and it was uh, it was work done actually uh, uh, spearheaded partly by Jeremy Charles, I think, might be in the audience. You can actually ask him about it. Um, um, the idea was was to talk about distributed generation and distributed power systems in the U.S. and and sort of the policy and frameworks around it. So it was joint work between Google and also Brookings Institute um, with, with a very broad audience. The three pillars that we decided to, that, that made sense, the first was economic, looking at, at sort of levelized cost of energy and, and sort of how that drives a lot of distributed generation um, policy. Environmental, so what is the difference really between distributed power and, and the power system and, and where are we going with that? And, and the third, which is actually was, was a pretty large focus, was national security, both on a defensive perspective, thinking about, well, what happens if you only got Six critical paths or uh, six six points within the, the critical path that you could take on the entire grid in the U.S. Um, as a defensive measure, but also thinking about from like the perspective of saving lives. So, what does distributed generation look like out in the field in the front lines, right, uh, for for the forces in like Afghanistan and elsewhere? So, it was absolutely an area of focus. Relating that back into the investment side, though, um, which is sort of the, the, the core of the discussion. I don't think that moves the needle, right? It's it's just as hairy an argument as saving the planet is from from an environmental perspective, right? It's still pretty nebulous just to say, oh, but there's national security, um, you know, implications of, of this business. You say, great. What's the business model like? I still don't know what to do with it, right? So, so I think from a policy perspective, the conversation is becoming richer and richer, uh, but from in the perspective of of the check writer, the investor. The, the corporate, I still don't think that's a sufficient argument for for investment for that as well. Ed? Ed Chancellor, so David mentioned the issue of not having customers. Uh, you can uh, respond quickly what Silicon Valley and investors could produce. And you, you just talked about the distributed energy revolution. What that means is you know, we're disintermediating many utilities. You do go direct to the customers and sell them solar panels from Solar City, or batteries from Tesla, or cars uh, from Tesla. So as we move that forward, the utilities aren't in the way. And what we need the regulators is to get out of the way and let that distributed revolution happen. And then we'll have 
competitive market where lots of innovators can go find a, a business on the home owner, uh, the, the operator of the whatever, and sell them the, the new technology and new ideas. So, and we have much quicker turnaround, much, many more failures, and much quicker turnaround than going to bring the utilities. So please take your pilot and improve my battery works. If I could piggyback on that, so, so DG being one end around, if you will, I want to want to want to be clear that you know the regulated space, given the size of investment, it still has a very large role. Uh, one of James' investments uh, in, in O-Power is a profoundly important company, and I look forward to things in very important ways. That being said, the good news that it, it, in 45% of the U.S., you can choose your power supply. Okay, you can't do that in California. Again, yet, um, but uh, but that but that is but that is the case, and so um, in addition to DG, right, um, this is possible. So something that we work on uh, at American Fission, building out what we call our Go Good Network, um, is is making that more possible. So to to, to launch points on in terms of the, uh, you know in the investment landscape more more broadly, is having that that pipeline of supply side stuff when it's respect to clean and energy more more more, more world large, very important, right? Um, this is a commodity, so this is a commodities market, really, we think of it as a pseudo-commodities market. That being said, there's also the demand side, right, and that's where, that's where our company comes to work and goes to work and comes into play, right, and the fact is that consumers today want to vote with their wallet, right, it's also a lot easier for them to do so because of price parity, it's coming from the supply side, right. There's also a demand side kind of articulation here, right? And so, and so again, in 45% of the U.S., you can choose to run your home on 100% renewable power by filling out, a, you know, a, a one or two step form online. This is possible, right? And so, and so, um, you know, I want to articulate that I think that you, as you look at investment in the sector and something that we've had to do, you know, looking at the regulated space and now more the deregulated space and also the end around of, of solar DG. Right? Is, is are there are there ways you can move quickly? Right? Are there are there ways you can look at this sector like any other, where you're not leading with your heart and you care about it. You're, you're leading with unit economics, right? Um, and so, and it's not so. That's not to say that I don't have very serious concerns also on the supply side. I would say that we have seen significant under under investment on the demand side, understanding that consumers can have a choice. Obvious, so, obvious. And, and also, if I may, person, and, and, and go for it. Like, and I'd like to take that into, if we can, some of the policy implications of paying attention and understanding at a, at a policy level, how, do, how can we increase consumer demand, and who really matters in that decision-making process. And it's not necessarily clear that the investment dollars in what, in, in what, in what matters from a policy kind of lobbying perspective actually fit the mold for what matters. So, so. And I think the subject of investing in, in energy-related sustainable areas has a classic impedance mismatch on short-term and long-term. And the reason is venture capital uh, pretends to be a long-term investment. That's a class, but as soon as, as soon as you have a long-term investment, your LPs are very upset. They want you to realize investment returns uh, in a cycle that, that matches your next fund, which is, is, that has stretched out so that very few companies are able to achieve that that LP desire. So startups that are investing in long-term energy solutions are actually best funded by long-term oriented investors. And there's a couple of public companies who have that because of the control of the company by the founders, and that's Amazon and Google and, and maybe Apple, who have just so much cash they can they can take a sizable amount of money and play over here and not really affect their PL and balance sheet. So VCs aren't really that wet. VCs have to find investable opportunities in technology and energy that have short-term payback. And there's some good news. There's some good news. Uh, you've got some trends right now that are investable that weren't five years ago. And it's just distributed. Our generation uh, trying to manage demand management and distribution automation, which has a lot of IT overlay. We love to play in that space. You, you know, the, we talk about utilities and how they think, and we can talk about how politicians think from that question. They play very logically given their motives and their DNA and, and how they're rewarded. How is an executive of the utility rewarded? I don't. Uh, I, I make a higher return by deploying capital. I go through the regulatory commissions or through the public utility commissions. I put capital in the grid and then I get increased my rate of return on that capital deployed. So 
I'm looking to deploy capital, not save money, not create uh, better results for my customers, deploying capital. Second, I don't want to get fired. So if I could get fired from a blackout, a brownout, capacity, so this is another good trend for investing, there's capacity limits being hit by the utilities across the country. Now there are reliefs coming in distributed power generation, but most utilities are saying, I can't afford to build a new plant, but I'm running out of uh, my capacity limits, so how can I manage the demand and the distribution more automatically, more real time, so I don't get, get into safety issues, brown out black issues. So not getting fired and employing capital, if you can meet those two, uh, needs of utilities. You can sell in utilities at a fairly rate. The other problem VCs have is we're motivated for explosive growth. We don't get rewarded for 10 year growth. A 10 year home run is uh, you may not be around to realize it. So, so what happens is you have to find opportunities that get rapid uptake. And you know, utilities and rapid uptake are not something you hear about a lot. So that makes sense. <laughs> So, uh, actually, exactly on that point, um, when, when we sort of thought about energy investing, it, it may feel like the this is on the demand side. Um, and, and sort of some of the big exits that you've seen so far have been predominantly on the demand side, from Tesla to Nest, uh, Solar City, which was one of ours. And the interesting thing was there was an announcement that the Solar City went and actually bought 10 power manufacturers. It's like the demand side is not eating the supply side. Um, but in terms of trends that are happening right now, what, what are the things that, that you're, you're seeing um, as being investable opportunities going forward, and, and including business model opportunities as well? So I don't want to exclude you from this conversation. Uh, so, so sort of the, the, the science, technology orientation, the business model orientation, but, but the things that are investable today, um, what's your take? I'll bring you there. Sure. I think that down, downstream solar is super exciting right now. It's growing like crazy. Uh, and the, you know, things are, the, the industry is doubling all the time. It's happening really fast. That's going to happen with, that storage is going to start to get incorporated into that. And there are going to be homes that are solar, its own, the home's own storage and its own electric vehicle as a, as a little island. And that, that is going to happen, and that is going to be a transformational shift, I think, in the way that, the way that our utility infrastructure exists. It's funny, there is, um, from my perspective, I would think that forward utilities might want to invest in some of those assets and own some of those assets uh, to get ahead of it. Most of the reaction that we have seen has been that they are trying to fight it and trying to charge a lot to, to interconnect with the grid. We'll see how that goes. That's a fight that's going to happen. But we're really excited about, about downstream solar and, and the storage is going to go along with it and the models will all be developed about that. The EV infrastructure is going like crazy too. And, uh, and we're really excited. We've seen that coming for years, but it's now happening that electric vehicles are selling you know, 5X as they were last year, or, or 5X or projections were. So it's, it's, it's real. Um, we also spend time, we spend time in things like the autonomous driving ecosystem, which uh, amazingly, I have, I have been in a car driving itself on a major highway in this country. I won't even say what state it is in. Um, that, that drove itself, and I could not believe it, that this was really happening, and it was really happening. And uh, it's, uh, uh, but but uh, that that is that will come, and, and I think there will again be some fundamental disruptions that happen in the transportation infrastructure, and uh, and what uh, what we expect. My brother jokes, it's like our kids are going to say, "Wait, they let you drive this?" <laughs> and I think there's something to it uh, when we look back. Um, we're also doing some looking at 3D printing, at um, at logistics, and uh, last mile shipping. Um, some, some of those types of things that, that are, again, moving, moving really fast and don't depend on large industry moving fast. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I might be a little biased based on my personal experience. Thinking back, so I was involved in, in starting a company that was developing a new, basically, material system architecture, manufacturing technology, first for solar, and then another company in the battery space. And I would say, looking back, you know, I, I was pretty young when we started those and felt like the luckiest person in the world because at the time the idea was, well, we're going to change the world by leveraging market forces using the venture capital model um, to, to build big companies and both make a huge impact and be probably successful and be wealthy, etc. And I'd like to say when I think back, my only explanation is that someone must have slipped something into the drink of the you know venture capital community here in the valley. Uh, thinking about those companies, because <coughs> while 
the fundamentals, I think, were there in terms of growth of those markets. Yeah, I mean, think about solar manufacturing, materials technology, you know, ultimately, if it's successful as a commodity market, it's hard to figure out where the margins are. It's obviously capital intensive and technically very hard. And it wasn't clear, you know, just the whole, the whole idea of first markets with high margins, high value, it's like looking back, it's not clear what those were for solar, honestly. And this is, you know. Um, and so when I look at the successes we've had since then, I say it was the companies that either realized that what they really are is a high margin consumer product company, or a customer facing business model innovation company, or by the way, we're not a biofuels company, we're a high value chemicals company. Um, and, and, and so I think we just have to be attuned to that today when we're thinking about the hard technologies that are longer time horizons, more capital intensive. I would say if the traditional venture capital timelines, constraints, um, you know, wins, definition of a win is not appropriate, who's going to come in and fill that gap? I and mean, the fundamentals are still there. I think there are folks with long-term horizons and with different constraints. I mean, uh, the venture capitalists on the panel can correct me. The way I put this is VCs need to see three things. Traditional VCs, to, for something to be investable, not only do you need a reasonably high multiple on return, but the absolute value of the outcome needs to be high enough to justify the time you're putting in and giving your, your fund. And the timeline has to be short enough where you can kind of look at your own views with a straight face and say, we're still creating value here. And so, my question is, those are three constraints that all need to be in place for the traditional VC model to work. What happens if we come up with investing models where we relax at least one of those constraints? And I think we're starting to see that now with investors that have, you know, different priorities. Um, meaning, we're happy to get a 10x multiple and have the total return be 30 million bucks and not 300 million bucks. That's pretty attractive. Or even a 5x multiple. We're happy to look at something at a longer time horizon. Uh, I think that's coming from everything from small angels and family office investors all the way to the other end of the spectrum of sovereign wealth funds that have different priorities. Um, what I'm not seeing is the entrepreneurial community finding a way to tap into those opportunities and saying, you know what, there is an ecosystem here that can make me as an individual successful working on this one problem. That last one, I think, yeah. is critical. So one of the one of the pieces here, entrepreneurs drive the success of all these companies. If you ever hear a venture capitalist say it's about them, it's, about, it's never about them. It's about the entrepreneur and about the companies that they're building. And the, the successes have come from incredible entrepreneurs. So the guys behind SolarCity, or the guys behind Tesla, or the guys behind O-Power, or Nest, or Solution, they are, they are the, the teams behind them. It's not, it's not single people. But they're exceptional teams, and what venture capitalists need is to, is to kind of back exceptional teams and run and do incredible things that, that they shouldn't be able to do. And I think one of the challenges is, it's not only the funding is sort of slipping, but the most exceptional teams in the world need to be coming together to try to solve these issues for them to get funded, for it to be successful, and for the virtual cycle to start again or to continue. And that's something that, that is concerning. And maybe a couple of uh, we're a smaller fund, so we invest in A and MC round uh, early stage on the IT side, and $100 million fund size, which lets us play for it. If, if we do one round and, and get a $50 million exit and a $2 million or something, that, that's okay. Man. But in general, we're still looking for bigger. Bigger is better, and faster is better. And there's a few areas that I think opportunities are, are particularly interesting. You, you mentioned the, the solar. We, we think solar and, and solar and wind are both growing fairly well. Wind without as much subsidy. Solar is still with more subsidy. And the, and the holy grail is short ones. And I think that's an investable area over the next 10 years. And it may not be a materials breakthrough. You, you, you know, if you know the folks here at Stanford Precourt Center, I'm sure you know I'm thinking about batteries and storage, and, and there may not be a 10x improvement in batteries for storage over time, but there will be more and more improvement in storage and the ability for you to take this intermittent power generation 
from the sun and wind, and, and then have storage kind of even it out. And then once that happens, the distributed model becomes, I think, unstoppable. So that would be a bigger fun than us. Where we're seeing interesting opportunities is right now, everyone is large corporations that are manufacturing, that are doing running refineries, running manufacturing plants, running utilities. They're all finding out that they can get real-time information on all of the moving parts of their enterprise. Whatever that workflow is of generating electricity and manufacturing components, you get real-time information, and once you have that and can act on it, you can reduce your energy cost, which is the easiest, lowest hanging fruit in energy uh, improvement for the country. And, and the challenges around doing that is you need real-time uh, sensor technology, real-time analytics and data, data management technology, and security. And security is big. So we're finding in the IT layer those three areas would be very uh, interesting. And uh, we recently hosted a a uh, IoT summit which talked about what do you do with all this sensor and technologies and, and Chevron showed up and, and other large corporations showed up. What we found, every single Fortune 100 company invited to a top person to this summit because they all know this is now uh, an investable opportunity for them. And they're looking at all the technologies in the valley to see what they can do to pick up a look at the So from the What's, what's your take on what's yeah, going on these days? I, 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 think, I think from the entrepreneur's perspective, uh, I think what's most important is that, um, you know, the, the comments earlier from, from David and Chris are really helpful in this regard, whereby, like, your customer needs to stand to gain or lose their job based upon what you provide. And unless you're doing that, you're not really solving the problem that's venture investable. Um, and, and I think that a lot of, of, of like early innovation in this, in this space and kind of you know, the ideas invested here, you know, five million here, two million there, what have you, have been, frankly, energy lovers invested, invested ideas where you're not paying attention to the fact that like the, you know, the, 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 the very intelligent you know, person at the utility, their, their incentive structure is not like what yours is. And like and, and, and that is it. And, and so I would say for folks looking at the space, you want to find find pockets within energy that, that allow for that. And the, end, the good news is that it's not pockets, it's massive, right? So 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 whether it's DG and the and the coming of DG, which Curtis and David and Pedro and are all are articulating, or again it's, it's today it's retail energy, right? Again, you know, you have uh, so, so just so for some more information, 45% of the U.S., you can choose your power supplier. You can choose to run your home on 100% clean power like today in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We are, we are helping people do just that, okay? Um, and so, and, and so, so that, that is a realm where you have different suppliers or retailers of power that are competing for a customer. Every single day, people at those companies go home and stand to gain or lose their job if they maintain customers or, 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 or add more. And if they don't do those two things, they're out of business. That's where you want to play, right? And, and so you need to look at so energy as a sector needs to be observed in the same way as any other vertical. It's not special. That's because it has massive social and policy implications internationally and domestically. That doesn't matter for the United Economics. It might motivate you and your guts, but it's not going to matter in terms of what grows a company. And so, and so this is something we have observed and learned organically at American Efficient, which for all intents and purposes is actually becoming a holding company. And the, and the brand we're rolling out is Go Good and our Go Good network, and I can speak more about what this is. This is not a plug for our company. Right? The, point, the point is, is that you need to make sure that you're answering real problems for your customer. If your customer is a business, right, that person needs to stand or lose their job based on what you provide them. Very simple. That's not different. Right in any sector you look at, and we be, look at this sector as if and because it is not different. Um, so, yeah, I was just going to mention an, an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thing going on right now that I think indicates that there's very new opportunities coming along in, in uh, sustainable energy. There's a guy named Guido Gray who's with Senior Tech in Cisco and was in charge of the Internet of Everything in Cisco. He recently left to join a Chinese wind power generation company, a multi billion dollar company out of China, run by a 30 something tech whiz, uh, incredible billionaire. And, and, and it's called Vision. And what Guido was hired to do was to come into this wind power generation company. And, and, and it's something a, a new utility can do that a, maybe an old 
uh, already in place locked in DNA until we cannot do. His job is to figure out rapidly where new IT, networking, Internet of Things technology can be deployed in their wind configuration, which I think will then be a driver to have to come and particularly marry that with some, some uh, storage solutions. They're going to be a very real threat to in place uh, power generators uh, globally, and that's what they're doing. They're still on the globally. Yeah, and another context from a startup. You know, executive side of the last company sold it to Google for homage with the energy management home automation. I think the yeah, investment dollars are normally a lagging indicator of what's happening. I think a better factor is looking at the smart, talented engineers and folks that are rushing to the opportunity. And if we're being honest, the uh, last company to do stuff was in energy. And what we saw is it was tough to really make make the recruiting effort to get people to feel like because of the time to actually deploy the solution that they were going to change the world fast enough. And so what we're seeing as we look across the sector of my current company, Greenway, of course, like we were beyond what the foregone Verizon direct to be. What we're seeing as Curtis mentioned, the way it's been repackaged, interesting enough from a marketing perspective for internet things, we can't we can't shut the doors long enough for all the folks that are trying to join the company. And so I think the interest from, from the investment side is when you look at the best engineers, and I left it when I left the Google, the folks that want to change the world, four or five years ago, they said, I'm tech, I can be in VR, I can join O Power, I can work with Scott and Silver Spring. The folks that really want to do something now, they're going into hardware, they're doing a maker movement, they're doing SOC stuff, some silicon stuff really uh, use a wireless network, or they say Internet of Things. And that's the one thing that's been interesting for me. Hedger Meyer flows and talk about all the time. I think the mind of a great engineer, a 10x engineer, or a 10x EV guy is, I want to do something where I can see the product get to market quickly. And so in one of our cases with our, one of our largest customers, uh, Verizon, we had something that went from a whiteboard that's going to go out to the street in less than 16 months. My experience, uh, just as an example, at Forum, we worked on a consortium with Census and Archivo for the UK Smart Grid project. I went and sold the company to the Motorola person to Google. Uh, I took some time off. I joined a new company, and I read this blog article about how the UK had awarded this smart gear contract to Census and Archivo. The time that I spent on an artifact was in 2008. The award was in 2013. It taken five years. I had went to Google, had left Google, started a different company, and that's when it happened. So, long way of saying, I think we really have to spend time on winning the hearts and minds of individual contributors and engineers. And my view of where I'm at is here in the Valley is they want to work for companies like Yes, they want to work for companies like Google Networks, which is one of Curtis's portfolio companies. They want to do something that's really fast. Yeah, I totally agree with Nate. And by the way, Nate is going to be on a panel later on this afternoon on, on the Internet of Things, so you can get to hear a little bit more about what this country is doing as well. Um, coming back on the policy side, which I know that was a specific question, um, what, what is the role, and what, sort of, we talked about federalism a little bit before, what, what are you guys seeing out there in terms of policy implications as it pertains to both investment and also from an entrepreneurial perspective? And, and clearly from where we use it, so we'd love to get a sense of sort of how that all fits in together. But if we can spend a few minutes and get each of your takes on, on the policy implications of this uh, ecosystem that we're really interested here as well. Yes, yeah, so but if I may, I have some pretty strong opinions about this. Um, and so, 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 so we, 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 we tended in national, at a uh, national media level, whether it, it makes it to the front page of the, 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 the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Post or what have you, Right, comments about Congress and, and Congress's inability to solve, you put a price on carbon, right? Um, Congress is very important and, and implications therein, what it, power are very, are, 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 are large. Where the needle can get moved today and now, right, is, is at, at the wholesale, in the wholesale, in the, in the wholesale energy markets, is at the, at the ISO level, right? So this is PJM, this is ISO New England, this is Cal ISO, MISO, what have you. Um, the, 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 this is this is a this is a level of of uh, you know, this is ISO is fall under FERC, right? So by way of background, um, it, at the ISO level, so, so so there's much you can do with respect to like greater access to commodities, right? Like 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 the form of commodity that is DG, and that being interconnected to the grid, right? It's not just state based, it's also at the ISO level as well, right? And then beyond that, you have the question of energy efficiency. 
right? So, so, so today, for instance, so today, for instance, in both PJMS in New England, you can bid energy efficiency into the ISO in the capacity market, which is the forward market, and competes directly directly with with, uh, with with generation. Fact, right? You can't, however, bid that same commodity into the real time market. The result of which is that only 20% of the actual value of energy efficiency is appropriately compensated in the market. It's a competitive ratio. I'm not going to comment on that now. The point is, is that um, the point is that you, you want to look at ways you can open up access and, and, and in fact, and put a price on efficiency, if you will, right, and allow entrepreneurs to go out and create that efficiency, right, as opposed to relying upon like a state-based program to make that possible, right? Energy efficiency, as we all know, is a price competitive commodity today. It always has been. Right? Why is it the case that like, there's one entity that has a monopoly of providing that commodity? I'm not sure why that is, right, conceptually. So that's got the wholesale level in terms of policy. Much more focused, if, you, if you're an academic in the audience, like, please, I'm happy to spend time. Like, you know, there's a lot to be done looking at the ISO. There's a lot more writing, a lot more attention. It's, it's, we haven't even scratched the surface. Folks that work on things like renewable and efficiency are understaffed at the ISOs. They do not have uh, the personnel on staff to move things quickly. That's a concern, right? Um, and then at the retail energy, at the retail energy level, um, it's, 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 look, it's working with state PUCs to ensure that um, you have, you're, you're enabling competitive behavior. That you're not having certainly po certain policy affects masquerading as privacy protections and different things, right? And so, that, so for me, and the way I look at the space, it, as the Dave also agrees, right, the state PUC level is really important, right? Not just on the regulated efficiency side, also on the competitive, like, deregulated energy side as well. So ISOs at the wholesale level, state PUCs um, at, at the retail level, and there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of great stuff um, that we can, and so it's not just Congress. I really wish that the, the Journal and the Times and that those desks would spend more time in this way, because that really is what can and will move the deal today and let it build on Congress, so. Uh, so I, I agree that uh, one, one broad comment, I think Ed brought up, or maybe Curtis, the folks that I've gotten to know in the energy industry are all extremely smart, very capable, um, and, and with the, uh, <laughs> um, and, and very, very smart, uh, very capable, mostly like really, really uh, motivated by the right things, and working within the, the rules that, that are set by, by regulation. It's a heavily regulated industry, great people. But I think that, that to expect folks working in regulated industry to act outside of the best interests of their entity doesn't make any sense. So it's it's the regulation matters a lot in this industry, and I think that it matters a lot at the state at the state level. And I think California has been a leader, and I think that there uh, what what could happen in PJM could be really really exciting now in, in New York, um, and and it, it matters a lot. And I think that the, the startup community can work closely with the regulators, but that's it's, it's difficult. Um, and uh, and again, it's, it's when when you read federal, like national headlines about energy, I think they kind of miss the point of where the real impact is. Yeah. Uh, I think on maybe just just to say quickly, the uh, the regulatory environment in energy is to be expected because it, it's providing a basic necessity for humans, and you don't want to go you want, don't want your grid to go down. And you, if you have a profit mode, maximizing margin. And having this five nine six nines reliability of the power grid, don't go there. So, so there is a regulatory uh, assumption there. I think that makes sense. You can look at a couple of adjacent markets and see what some interesting startups are doing to fight the regulatory battles. One of my favorite is Uber. Why does Uber? Why does Uber have? I think a long-term win against the regulatory municipal taxi industry. One, it's, very, it's a very, uh, I would say, distributed, fragmented set of uh, opponents for them. And two, it's such a great improvement. It is one of those 10x better improvements. You know where your car is, you know when it's coming, and, and, and you get what you expect, versus well, trying to get a taxi somewhere. So, so Uber solves a big pain point. Once they go into a market, their customers don't want to go back. All they have to do is turn on the social network of their customers at the local unis, at the state level, and they're going to win every time. Airbnb, maybe less so. Why? Because the hotel lobbies are much more concentrated and effective and send huge TLT dollars into those municipalities and states. 
So, you know, your taxi business goes away, everybody's going to survive. Your hotel tax dollars go away, maybe not. So, Air and Airbnb, it doesn't really go love them as much as, you know, they're just saving money. And, and you know, if the hotels drop prices, they're not going to like it any better than Airbnb. The taxis can't respond, the hotels could. So, I think in energy, back to what we were kind of talking about, those are interesting learnings. Where can we bring in technologies that's so much better and that pleases the end voter? That then they can we can turn on social networks just like Uber's doing. They go town by town and they, they just fire up the, the emailing social networking onslaught into the elected officials and they win everything. So I think that's going to be one thing that plays out. There. Before we talk, Diane, I think we're going to have a comment. Sure. Um, Diane Burnett, um, was a uh, former commissioner of California. See, many of you saw the same. A couple of um, comments. Um, I want to encourage the investment community to reach out to those mysterious regulators. Mm -hmm. Now, I still have the story that when Alex and Dan were the only two guys at Oak I got introduced to them. They came into my office and they showed me, you know, the, what they were doing with smut. And I got so excited that as a policymaker, I was able to change the rule in California which allowed energy efficiency and behavioral change savings to not put into the polls. You know, and say, you know, have the best technology, the best team, the best you know, um, investments, but state policymakers can kill your entire business plan, and they won't even know that they've done it. And so um, they're certainly, um, uh, it, Policy makers and their fans are just overwhelmed with all the changes going on. And unfortunately, the job descriptions for most government energy policy agencies completely don't match up with the world that they're in. Um, but reach out and educate them. Bring, I also, over the years, um, made the point to come to Silicon Valley about every six months and have, you know, and, you know somebody hosts bringing in different. Um, companies, and then I would give them a little talk, and it just informed me so much, and I would love to see more of that going on around the country, because policymakers at the state level can change policies, but that they may not know what's going on, so I'll put my part in that. I'm here at Stanford, and one of the reasons is that Stanford has made a major commitment to try to get better linkages with the policy side. And then just quickly, I wanted to um, emphasize what Ross said, that our traditional advocacy groups in the area of the demand side, um, they have not paid attention to the wholesale side. And again, um, working that level is, is incredibly important. Just a, a, a plug for Dan, by the way. She, she's been instrumental in, in actually organizing this, uh, this, this summit, so, so thank you. And I, I'm just going to put in one, then I'll put in one, one of my projects here at Stanford is a very, is a um, multi-year effort of thinking about the next generation of energy efficiency with three components. And I'm reaching out if anyone's particularly interested. One is moving away from a utility-centric policy environment on energy efficiency because of the uptake we need to have and the leveraging We've got to think of a different model. Um, two is more rapid um, acceleration of bringing in innovation and technology. And the third is going to be measurement and verification with a very big focus on persistence and savings and that. So um, I'm looking forward to everybody who has great ideas. But um, I thank Sam for a lot of resources and really thinking about this over the next few years. Thank you. There's a question there. Yeah, my question is about you know, some of the barriers that I see around you know, broader scale adoption of renewable technologies, and, and, and one of the big barriers seems to be around resolving issues of uh, grid reliability and load balancing issues. And, and so my question about the regulatory environment is, does our regulatory system properly price those grid reliability services to reward investments in those stations uh, around energy storage and our grid, and, 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 or do we actually have some kind of Deep pricing that um, that sort of. It's not correct. It's not. It's not correct. Yeah. I don't. I don't think not price correctly. Not not um, short term enough 
to pay the, to pay new resources to hop on the grid and provide short-term frequency regulation or other ancillary services that would solve those problems, um, but but require a lot of capital investment right now. I mean, I, I probably have a just higher level policy point related to that, which is, um, you know, I used to think this game is all about technology, and I now think it's all about policy. And if we're lucky, we can have <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, let, let me finish the sentence. Let me finish the sentence. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll have a chance to develop options on technology that are there when the Policy Act gets its own together. When the policy folks get their act together, um, I think you know. I think the grid. I think the renewables and grid integration is, is a great example of this, where there's been all this talk about. Oh, and I think a gentleman in the back said, "Why don't we get the regulators out of the way and just go direct to consumers with DR and these sorts of things?" And you basically say, "Okay, that's a nice thing to think about, but ultimately, when we look at the real problems of keeping the grid up with renewables and the problems around." Integrated renewables, and you ask yourself, whose problem is that? Right? It's not my problem as the consumer. On the demand side, it's not necessarily. I think you have created that. Uh, it's been right. so right. It's really, really, really um, you know, ultimately, I think the problem lies at the ISO level or the FERC level, and it's something we're going to have to solve. And so, one of the examples we found at RPE, we have a program called Genie, developing tremendous technology capabilities to be able to basically implement switching um, across the transmission the transmission system, right? So create a much more efficient system by reducing our drive opportunities. Instead of having to basically build a bunch of more transmission, let's be smart about how we can actually control the flow of electrons through the grid. The technologies are there. One of the things we found is, A, well, if you're trying to make an efficient grid across large areas, now you're talking about some municipalities or regions that are going to pay less to make an efficient but others that might pay more. And yet, given where all that regulation happens, who's, who's really motivated to implement those things, number one? Number two, you say, well, we can create markets to account for this. Uh, we were investing in basically the, hard, the power electronics hardware technologies and software control theory that we need to go into how do you even do unit commitment calculations on a grid, where as soon as you can now have switches on the grid, you've got a factorial problem where you're now talking about, you know, a thousand to the thousand versions of the grid that could be, you know, that need to be part of that calculation. So we we're really investing in fundamental technologies, and then we realized, you know, we started talking to folks at the ISOs, and they said, well, even if this existed, how would we deploy it? What's the fair market? to decide whether a switch is in state one or two. And what we realized is to create that market would probably take 10 years or five years in today's environment where you have to get regulatory folks at the state level and the federal level and economists and technologists together. Um, and you know, I think we gotta find ways to solve those system level problems. Um, you know, I'll just say on this, on this real time, you know, factorial problem of, of managing the grid, we found a very interesting valley kind of opportunity. There was a there was a world class team that had built electronic design automation software, which is really hard to do. So that this is what Intel and Nvidia used to check to, to test a hundred million switches on a chip. So it's kind of the same problem. It's this infinite number of switches and, and ways that they can interrelate, and you test and diagnose and, and analyze, and you do it as close to real time as possible because you're making these things and you need to get them out the door. That technology exists, and if anybody is familiar with the Precourt Center, this company AutoGrid is that team dropped into the utility switch analysis and Internet of Things analysis, and it, and it has a it has one of those solutions that everybody knows that they need to move this way. And every single utility you talk to has piloted it, and everyone who's piloting it is adopting it. And so it's sort of interesting that that problem is is being solved with valid technology that already existed, and you sort of port it over. That's kind of an IT approach to it. So in the in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to ask one one question, which I always find quite interesting, is, is sort of the magic wand question. If you had the magic wand, you do anything with it. You know, what would you do in, in sort of 30 seconds or less? Uh, mine would probably be, you know, transport myself to Brazil. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm on the plane 
yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, I'm just yeah, the moderator, yeah. so I don't get stuck with it. It's just fine. Um, Dave? So I would have, I probably would have had the industry and had invested less um, four or five years ago and have sort of a steady, steady climb or a steady drum beat into the successes that we've had in the last 12 months so that there wasn't this hangover uh, that we had to talk about at, at these types of events to think about. Um, and, I, and then I would probably also have more clarity and communication between between regulators, both on the state and federal sides. Just uh, kind of know the, know the rules of the game uh, as you're as you're playing a little bit better. And then um, I mean, just continue to attract the best entrepreneurs in the world to help solve these problems because that's what's going to solve. Them. Uh, I think thinking about sort of the early stage innovation, I think my magic wand would be kind of get us to the realization that at least here in the U.S., when we think about taking sort of more disruptive um, ideas from the academic research sphere to corporations, we basically depend on one model to do that, which is the VC ecosystem, and it's a great model when everything lines up, and um, realizing that when things don't line up and, you know, you're in a situation like this where we've got a very important problem to solve, and the VCs aren't investing in the stage. We need to we need to invest in new models, and I think you know it means that government and industry and other types of investors need to step up uh, and, and create a different way. Yeah, I mean for me, uh, so three things. The first, I'm gonna echo Dave. Great entrepreneurs great people who want to attack the problem, right? We have to keep feeding the ecosystem, keep feeding the ecosystem, right? Without that, without the human capital, nothing happens if we're just in a state of non-movement, right? That's number one. Number two, if I can make the way of magic wand, um, I, I, I might have an appropriately deregulated uh, energy markets and opportunities everywhere. Um, and, and, and I'd say that very, you know, that, that is not a rush to move. That's done very carefully, that's done very appropriately. Um, and I think you had lessons learned from the past. That's number two. Because what that does is and that puts people in the market, not just DG. The reason you see a solar city in DG is an end around around the model. That is, that is not competitive. That's why it exists. That's why we have money flowing to it. There's a reason for this, right? It's not the, at first the cheapest way of doing things at all, right? It's, it was an end around. So let's make that end around everywhere, right? That's number two. Number three is put a price on efficiency, right? At the ISO level, fully compensate permanent low reduction energy efficiency so that, you know, reactors can fit into a market, right, uh, their energy efficiency and to replace generation directly. This is already done in PJM and ISO New England at the, in the capacity market level. So if you want to write on this, this is like fertile ground. Um, it is not done in the energy only market. There are compensatory issues with that. That's a problem. Uh, today, um, those are my three great entrepreneurs, common deregulated markets, price and efficiency at the next level. So. I, I would say that, in addition to the comments that have been made about why solar is, is working, it may be uh, in reality that it's not competitive, but I think the reason solar is where it is, it, it is fast growing and one of the more interesting uh, in the U.S. sustainable uh, areas of, of generating power. Is because of the capacity constraints that utilities have, and they can't build the power plants that they would like to build, because that's the point. Not that they can that. But politically and environmentally, they can't do it, so they need really, and the solar was really, I think they, they didn't fight to kill it as much as I think they would have but because of that. And I think that's the reality. It's in their interest to allow that search tank to, to take pressure off. So I do think on sustainable energy, we've got to eventually be there. One of the big choke points is storage. I think storage is I've been able to find a way to mention one. Uh, low cost storage, uh, you would see sustainable growth rapidly. We've already got great things going on in wind and solar. Every year, the big players that are now in those spaces are making incremental improvements. Probably nothing quantum, but you're going to see those uh, technologies get better and better, more sustainable on their own. You can put storage in there. In there. Great. Well, uh, I know there's some, some questions still remaining, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, myself and these folks are going to be here uh, over the next little while and through lunch. So uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.